church, will you sing with me? When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see the mountain And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing we have to fear. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, and if you are for me, who can be against me? There's nothing impossible for him. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. All I see are the ashes You see the beauty All I see is the cross When all I see is the cross God, you see the empty tomb So when I fight I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted up battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, battle belongs to you. In almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our you shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for this time to gather in your name and in your word. Lord, we, we gather because you are awesome. We gather because we need to. We gather because we need your forgiveness and grace. Lord God, you know us, and you know that we sin against you in our thoughts, and our words, and our actions by not doing uh, what you command us to do, 
and by doing what you command us not to do. Lord God, we are sinners and we need your forgiveness. So we're going to take some time right here in the quiet of our hearts, confessing our sin to you and asking for your forgiveness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. A Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came and died on a cross for your sin and for mine so that you might be forgiven and free. And as a servant of the word, I announce this grace of God to you and by his promise, forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you for this past week. We thank you for this time uh, to celebrate you, to celebrate your creation, to celebrate your providing, to celebrate your forgiving, to celebrate your rising, to celebrate your life and our life because of you. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for this time, for this privilege, for this honor, Lord, we thank you for the ways you provide and Lord, for the ways you provide for us to help provide for others. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being your hands and your feet in this world. Lord, we thank you for the joy of serving you and serving those around us. Lord, we find our purpose and our joy in you. Thank you so much, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of helping to carry others' burdens. Lord, we thank you for the, the comfort of having others come around us and help carry our burdens, Lord. This is how you've designed us. This is how you've designed your kingdom, Lord God. And it's beautiful. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we lift up those in need of your healing. We pray for Tom's sister, Susan, for Scott's brother, Brad, Lord, we lift up a, a, a young man uh, in need of your healing, Lord, and your guidance. Lord, we lift up Tom's mom, uh, who's in hospice, Lord. We thank you that she is resting securely in your pierced hands. And Lord God, we thank you for the gift of life and for birthdays of those we love, Lord, for Larry, John, and, and Larry, another Larry, Lord God. Uh, we love him, you love him too, Lord, thanks so much. And we pray all these things together in your name, as you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But only trust in Jesus' name. He is our cornerstone, and it's Christ alone. The cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, He is Lord, He's Lord of Darkness seems when dark.
darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Behold, my anchor of Gracious Savior Church, where we love Jesus, each other, and all people. Here are a few ways we can accomplish the mission together. I'm Josh. And I'm Matt. And we are the youth leaders at Gracious Savior Church. Every Wednesday, we host a youth night, fun experience for middle and high schoolers. We have food, fun and games, and quality time following Jesus together. Contact one of us to learn more. Hi, I'm Andrea, and I am a small group leader here at Gracious Savior. This year, we are walking through the story, a version of the Bible that is edited for only the essential narrative of God's redemptive plan for his people. We have started several small groups, both in person and online, so join one of them as your schedule permits. Sign up for a group and get your free copy of the book. You can do so at the table just outside the sanctuary or on our website, graciousavior.org. Hi, my name is Janie Kleiber. I'm a volunteer for our Grief Share groups at Gracious Savior. Grief Share is a grief support group for anyone who is recovering from the loss of a loved one. If you or someone you know needs love, support, and care, then we want to encourage you to come to one of our sessions. We host Grief Share here at the church every Monday night at 530. All are welcome, and we hope you can find the support you need. Hi, I'm Bev Christensen, the prayer and senior ministry leader here at Gracious Savior. Every Thursday night at 6 o'clock, we have our prayer group. Everyone is welcome. 
Come if you would like to pray, be prayed for, or to grow in prayer. This ski season, we have the pleasure of joining up with Mountaintop Services. What that means is that we will be hosting small church services Sunday afternoons beginning at 1230 on the following dates, January 24th, February 14th, March 7th, and March 28th. These services will be held in Beaver Creek just by Spruce Saddle. So reserve those days on your Epic app or online, and we would love to see you there at 1230 on one or all of those dates. Can't wait to see you there and worship God with you and his creation. Holy Week is coming up, and we will be hosting a Good Friday service, a reflective meditative service on what it means for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins on Friday, April 2nd at 7 p.m. We will have online and in-person options for this service and for our Easter service, which is Sunday, April 4th at 7 a.m., 9 a.m., and 10.30 a.m. Normal years, we would have you bring food, but this year we will be providing coffee and donuts for everyone. If you feel called to support our ministry financially, you can do so through one of three ways. Our website, graciousavior.org, or our Gracious Savior Church Venmo account, or you can give a physical offering at one of our two offering boxes. There's one by the exit out of the sanctuary and one by the exit out of the whole building. Giving is by no means an obligation and you should only give if you feel called to. What it does do is enable us to fulfill God's mission in this valley. So thank you so much for your faithful giving. It really has helped us love Jesus, each other, and all people. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are in session nine of the story. Last week, Josh did a great job covering session eight, which is basically the book of Judges. Now, if you were inspired by his explanation of the book of Judges as Shakespeare in the Bible, you may have read the entire book, not just the summary that's in the story, but the entire book of Judges. And if you did, you would realize it's a mess. It's a disaster. Things just get worse and worse and worse. And it's summarized by that, that, that poignant phrase, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Blech. But it's not all bad. There were some people living in that era, which is around 1300 to 1000 BC, who were really great people. And we're gonna hear about some of them in the book called Ruth. It's in session nine of the story, and it's in the Bible, in the, the book of Ruth, or as I prefer to call it, Naomi and Boaz love a great young woman named Ruth. Now for us to get the full impact of the book of Ruth, we need to summarize and put its place in the canon of the story. So here we go, buckle in. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was very good. It was perfect. And as Mike Toole said, a short time later, that didn't take very long, we messed it up. And it's broken. Everything's broken. Our perfect relationship with God, broken. Our perfect relationship with each other, broken. Our perfect relationship with creation, broken. So God made a promise. He would send one. One who would come. One who would crush Satan's head and he would be victorious and he would restore that perfect world again, those perfect relationships again. In essence, the story of the Bible is beginning, middle, new beginning. Things continue along and they get worse and worse. God wipes the slate clean with a flood and then he comes to one particular man, a man named Abraham. And God makes Abraham a covenant, a promise, not because of who Abraham is, but because God is gracious. And he makes Abraham this promise. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, curse you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. 
God does bless Abraham and his descendants. And they do become a great nation, but a great nation enslaved in Egypt. So God redeems them with an outstretched hand and a mighty, with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand. God redeems them and brings them out of Egypt into their own place. And God had a goal for them. The goal was that the purpose of Israel, they were to be a light to all the other nations. And all the other nations would be, would be drawn to Israel and their God by the strength of their character and their integrity and their love. That was God's goal for the nation of Israel. So how'd they do? Well, as we learned in Judges, not very well at all. But there is some bright spots. And a bright spot is in the book of Ruth. And it begins like this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, Elimelech. his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. They went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come to with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. It's beautiful. Food is tight in Israel, so Naomi, her husband, her two sons, they go to Moab, which Moab is east of Judah. Not exactly a lush paradise there, but it, things are better there, so they move there. Their two sons marry, Orpah and Ruth, and life is good for a little bit. And then it gets bad. Really, really bad. Naomi's husband passes away. Her two sons die as well. This is bad in any culture and in any time. But in this time and in this culture, it's particularly bad. I'm, I'm sad to say that, that women in this time and era had very little rights and protection. 
They were at the whim of the people around them. It was a very tough, very sad, very challenging place to be. And Naomi decides that her only real option is to move back home, back with family, and try to get help from them. Her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, really, they only have one realistic option as well, to move back home with their families and, and try to get married again. It's sad to say, and in that time in that era. But they pick plan B. They stay with Naomi. And Naomi knows this is a lose-lose scenario for them. This is, this is a horrible decision on their behalf. Naomi can't care for them. They're going to be living with a foreign people. They'll be foreigners in a strange land, and, and foreigners are not always treated very well, especially in this time and era. And so Naomi pleads with them, go back home. Orpah does. Ruth Ruth stays, and she says those great words, wherever you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord, may Yahweh, your God, and now my God, may the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates you and me. Why? Why does Ruth decide to stay with Naomi? I mean, it's not her mom, it's her mother-in-law. And, and things throughout the centuries have been the same. Moms and mother-in-laws and their daughters-in-law, they don't always get along very well, but Ruth and Naomi, they have an incredible relationship. What's going on here? Why does Ruth stay and subject herself to a life of hardship. Well, I think there's only two reasons. One, she has pity and compassion on Naomi, whose plot in life is, is gonna be, it's gonna be hard for Naomi. She's older, she can't get out there and harvest for herself. She's gonna stay with Naomi. But two, she's drawn to Naomi. Naomi has loved her. And the text doesn't say why or how Naomi loved Ruth, but it's clear that she does. And we know it's not by her positive, upbeat attitude either, you know? Uh, Naomi is crushed. When she gets back home, she tells her family, don't call me Naomi anymore, which means pleasant. She says, call me Mara, which means bitter. But in spite of this, Ruth loves Naomi because Naomi loves Ruth. And Naomi lived her life in such a way that the people around her knew that she, Naomi, loved them and that her God loved them too. And that was the whole point of Israel. Israel's goal was to live in such a way that the nations around them would be blessed. They'd be drawn to them by the strength of their character and their integrity and their love for God and know God's love for them. Naomi is fulfilling Israel's purpose right here. How did she do that? Well, people, the same way people have always done it. By doing the things that they love and sharing that gift with the people around them. This was Israel's calling. It's the church's calling too, to attract people to God. To attract people to God so that they might know God's love for them. So how do you do that? Because Israel's God's calling for Israel is the same exact calling that God has for his church today to live our lives in such a way that the people around us are attracted to us and God who loves us and them. 
So how do you do that? Well, some of you really like fixing things. You're really good at just fixing stuff. I am not good at fixing stuff. I'm good at breaking stuff, but I'm not good at fixing stuff. Some of you are great at fixing things. Share that gift with the people around you. Not just your family members and your coworkers, but make that circle just a little bit wider. Some of you like, like making food. I, I do not like making food. I like cleaning up from people who like to make food, but I don't like making food. But some of you love to bake and cook. Share that gift with the people around you. Some of you like talking and listening to others. Some of you are great at that. Share that gift with the people around you. Not just those in your home or those that you work with, but make that circle just a little bit broader. And you will be fulfilling the purpose of the church. The church has the same exact calling as Old Testament Israel to be a light to all people, attracting people to God who loves them. We do that together as a community, as the body of Christ in this place, which, by the way, come on back. If you're feeling safe and secure, come on back to worship because we were not called to be in church by ourselves. It's not church. We are called to be together, to be a community, attracting others around us by our love, by our light, attracting them to the God who loves us and them. We do it together, and we do it as sent out representatives of Jesus Christ, who loves you and the people around you. Not only is a church called to be like Naomi, we're also called to be like Boaz. Ruth follows, protects, comforts Naomi back to Israel. And once they get there, they got a problem. They have to eat. And so Ruth sends Naomi, I'm sorry, Naomi sends Ruth out into the fields. You see, the Torah had provided, had a provision to uh, help those in need. In those days, people were to, they were called to by the Torah to harvest their fields, but not all their fields. The Torah said that they were to leave the edges of their field unharvested so that people in need could come by later and gather the edges of the field for themselves. So Ruth does that. She follows, she picks a field. It's owned by a, name, name, a man named Boaz. And Ruth is in Boaz's field, gathering on the edges. And Boaz sees her. He takes pity on her. So he tells his workers to purposely every now and then drop some stuff that they're harvesting. Just, just drop it, casually drop it, so that when Ruth is coming by later afterwards, she can pick it up. While they're eating, uh, Boaz calls her over, invites them to have a meal together. And then Boaz, uh, to Ruth and in front of all his workers, says to her, you are safe here. And I imagine he looked around at his workers, right? She's safe here, right? And his employees are like, yeah, yeah, boss, we got it. We got it. She's safe here. Don't touch the foreigner. And she is safe. She's protected. See, the second job of the church is we are to, one, attract people to Jesus, but two, we're also to lead the way in protecting those in our community who are at risk. We are to protect those in need. We are to protect the marginalized. We are to protect those whom life has hit hard and don't want a hand out, but a hand up. We're called to protect. As uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman so vividly wrote, in this world there are sheep, and there are wolves, and there are sheep dogs. The church is to be a sheepdog. And Boaz, he's a sheepdog. 
He sees someone in need, someone who needs some protection, a hand up. And Boaz is determined to be that man. Likewise, the church is called to protect. This space, this sanctuary, is both uh, sacred and safe. In this space, tears are wiped away. In this space, burdens are carried. In this space, the broken are comforted. In this space, the weak are guarded. And in this space, the hopeless are given hope. Because that's what the church is called to do. That's what sheepdogs do. Boaz protects Ruth in another way, another specific way. He redeems her. Naomi uh, notices what's going on between Boaz and Ruth. And Naomi knows because she's smart. She knows that Boaz is a distant relative. And she explains to Ruth that this means that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Now, what that means is this. The Torah, uh, the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament, they had another way of taking care of widows, particularly younger widows, who did not have adult-aged children who could care for them. So if there was a, a younger widow in the community, it was the role of the closest male closest unmarried male relative of the deceased husband to marry the widow. And that way, the widow would be protected and, and guarded and loved and cared for. But there was a catch. If this new family had a son together, the son would carry on the name of the dead first husband, and so um, what that meant was the inheritance would not go to the husband's family, but rather to the dead first husband's family. And in an agricultural society, this is really important because you're not giving your land to your side, you're giving your land to someone else's side. And so you could see why some men did not want to do this. But Naomi, she's a smart one. And she says to Ruth, after some time, she says, Ruth, I want you to get super dressed up. Put on the best clothes that you have. And tonight, when Boaz and his workers are on the threshing floor guarding the harvest, sneak up there tonight. Find Boaz, make sure you find the right man, and lay down at his feet and put his blanket over you. This is a little weird, but essentially what Naomi is asking Ruth to do is this. Tonight, ask Boaz to marry you because he is a kinsman redeemer or in some translations, a guardian redeemer. So imagine, imagine you're a young woman and there's a man who's very, been very, very kind to you, but you're just friends, right? And you go up to that young man's door at night, and you knock on his door and he answers the door and you have a ring and you get down on one knee and you say, will you marry me? Pretty bold. And this is what Ruth does. She goes up to the threshing floor at night. She finds Boaz, right? Get, gotta get the right guy. And she lays down at his feet and puts his blanket over her. Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night and finds Ruth there and immediately knows what's taking place. She's asking him, to marry her. And Boaz says this, 
at that moment, yeah, I'm gonna marry you. Why does Boaz do this? Well, two reasons. One, he knows his responsibility. He, he knows his role is to protect, and he will do that. And two, as the story of Ruth indicates, he was pretty sweet on Ruth anyway. Naomi was pretty smart there, that one. And so he does. He marries Ruth. He marries Ruth to provide for her and her mother-in-law, right? Because Naomi's got no more children, so Ruth Boaz provides for her now too, as was right in the custom in those days and to this day today. And the book ends with Boaz and Ruth having a son. And one of the last verses of the book of Ruth is this. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. The text might as well have read, Naomi has a son again. It's beautiful. It's uh, one of the most beautiful love stories uh, in the Bible uh, anywhere, really. I don't, I don't know why they haven't made this to a movie yet, because it's incredible. But why does the Bible tell us this? Why does the Bible have this sweet little love story? I mean, the whole book of Ruth is only about five pages long. Why does the Bible tell us this? Here's why. Boaz's land was passed down to his new son. And this land was located just a bit outside a little town called Bethlehem. And Obed had a son. Obed's son was named Jesse. And Jesse's son was named David. And David was a shepherd boy outside of Bethlehem when he is anointed the future king of Israel. Boaz and this foreigner Ruth become ancestors of Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible tells us this cute little love story. See, God used Boaz to redeem Ruth and Naomi, and eventually through Jesus, you and me. Jesus redeems you. He does not do it by giving up his family inheritance. He does it by giving up everything. Jesus Christ gives up everything. He dies on a cross to redeem you. He rises from the grave to give you life. Jesus attracts us with his love. He protects us by his grace and power and redeems you by his blood. This is the greatest love story ever told. And you are part of that story because you are the beloved. In the New Testament, it describes the church, it describes you as the bride of Christ. Some of you dudes are going like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not all about that. But you are loved by God. You're cherished by God. Even you sheepdogs out there, God protects you. God attracts you by his grace. And God, in Jesus Christ, redeems you by his blood, by his sacrifice, and by his love for you. It is the greatest love story ever told. And by the grace of God and through faith, it's your story too. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for Boaz. Thank you for Ruth. 
Thank you for Boaz's faithfulness and thank you for Ruth's love and commitment. Lord Jesus, thank you for using them. Lord Jesus, thank you for using us. Thank you for attracting us to you by your love. Thank you for protecting us by your grace. And Lord, thank you for redeeming us. Lord, we ask that you would send us out to attract others to you, to protect others in your name and to show them to, and introduce them to you, Lord God, our Redeemer and our friend. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. May the grace of God, which passes all understanding, may it guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus our Lord for life everlasting. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. behind your regrets and mistakes. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born, Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. life down for us. So we sing, oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before She 
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. <laughs>